Good morning, John. This is weird. A couple of weeks ago, I got an email from the Department of Transportation being like, the secretary is going to be in Missoula celebrating the opening of your amazingly dope new airport. And since you're also going to be in Missoula, maybe you'd like to do a vlog to get, they didn't use the word vlog. And I said, yes. And I said, the thing that I want to do is, could he ask me questions? And then I'll ask him questions. It'll be like a dual interview. And they liked that. And so that's what we did. And as I was editing it, I realized that there are things I wanted to go deeper on. So we will pull out sometimes for little interstitial bits to explain things further. And now you know all the things. So let's get started. I have so many questions. I'm going to start with what's the lapel pin? Oh, this is our DOT. I think it's called a triscallion. Three whole onions. Uh, well, that's a thing I said. The Department of Transportation triscallion represents the three different areas that we transport in the water, the sky, and the ground. I have a very large pin collection. Oh, right, well, yeah, here. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we can. I have presents yeah. for you, so you we can go. trade. Right. An exchange. Great. I will, yeah. I'll, I'll take it. It's a vintage. Uh, Real life vintage garden. Really field. nice. I have a Snoopy that this would, this would actually be perfect right next to it. It's been great doing business with you. Yeah, what? it's very transactional with the government, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it can be. I'm confused about a lot of things that I think people should know. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, who owns the airport? It depends, but it's usually the city or the county. Right? Okay. One is who pays for the airport. Uh -huh. So part of that is, is the local government. Part of its passenger facility charges is one of the many, you know, you, you buy a ticket, there's the airfare, and then there's a whole bunch of charges that go with it. One yeah. of those goes toward uh, funding the airport. I just looked this up. I thought that it would be like a fairly large number and it would be like a percentage of the ticket price. But no, to like be a passenger at an airport, it costs money. You like, it's like an entrance fee, basically. And at almost every airport in the US, it is $4.50. The, the airport has a $4.50 cover. Sometimes the airlines will just invest in an airport, especially one where they have a big presence. And then part of it's what, what I'm actually doing in Missoula today was celebrating the Biden-Harris administration putting federal funds into the airport. Yeah. Thank you. The airport is very nice now. It, it's lovely. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really impressed. But the other thing I would say is this is actually becoming politically salient because there are a lot of places, notably in the South, where states are uh, pressing to take more control of airports, mm -hmm. which are currently under the control under local control. We officially are we don't have a direct role in that, but sometimes we're concerned about what's going on with some of those dynamics and whether that will lead to the airport continuing to. Uh, to, to operate well. So I looked into this and there are some big airports in the South that the states are trying to take control of. And I was like, what is that about? But these are places where the state government tends to be very conservative and the city government where there are big cities, thus where there are big airports, tends to be more progressive or liberal or Democrat or whatever. And as you might expect, these groups have tension in various ways. And so the states have been trying to take over the airport from the city, which I agree is troubling. So it is important who owns the airport or who operates it. And usually it's in local hands. I just feel like the airport like works really well. You know, obviously that like we think about the times when it doesn't work really well. Yeah. But I feel like usually I'm like, ah, this is a, a lot of complicated things. I have no idea how it happens. It just happens. Well, that's how it's supposed to work. Right. We're trying to make sure it's like that more of the time. Right. Because the problem is, of course, if any one of those things yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. And you got a lot of airport. Most of our airports actually were built pre 9-11, mm -hmm. so yeah. just the whole architecture, just the security checkpoints alone, right, and how you would set it up has to be different now than it was when they set these up. Yeah. And there are a whole bunch of other things, much of which we're now funding the replacement of from the the geometry of a taxiway and whether, where you ha whether you can have it set up so that an air airplane never even has to cross the path of another airplane. Oh, so you saw my brain light up there for a second because I had never thought about how you have to design taxiways to make it more efficient and also safer and that there are different ways to do it. And an end around taxiway has a plane travel farther, but it actually speeds things up for everyone involved because there is less waiting for planes to cross things. Like planes crashing into each other on the ground is a very big deal and a very big concern. So like if you have a plane landing, they can't like stop, they're going plane speed and you have a plane crossing and those two planes crash into each other, you get two plane crashes at once. We of course have lots of ways to stop this from happening happening, but it has happened before. And so making it impossible to happen is good. But additionally, it means that more planes can land faster and planes don't have to like sit there waiting for planes to land before they can get to the terminal. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, uh, it's a very good idea. Doing it after the fact can yeah. be expensive. Uh, do you have a question for me? Tons. Yeah. Well, so I'm told your origin story partly goes back to a rant about I-4. So I want to- Oh, wow. Yeah. Hear your... The Buttigieg team's doing its research. In 2002, I had a blog called IHateI4.com, which is about the interstate in Orlando and how much people dislike it and how we could do it better. Uh, wow. And so I figured I could make a website about that and people would look at it, which is all I wanted at the time. 
just people looking at me. Uh, uh, politicians <laughs> get started the same way. Did you want people to look at you when you you were young? Were you like uh, uh, actually no? When I was young, I wanted to be an airline pilot. You pilot. look right now. I'm sorry, like an airline pilot. Well, thank you. Another thing I said. Oh my god. I mean, I have plenty of transportation rants still. Parking. Uh, yeah. Pete. Well, why do we have so much parking? Because we have it's, so many cars. I think when p- people set parking minimums as a municipality, yep. they don't think about the costs of that. Yes. They don't, don't think about how much space that's taking up, how much it's taking away from bike lanes, how much it's taking away from totally. other built environment. When you're setting it for, for neighborhoods, you don't have think oh. about how much t- yeah. space it's taking away from homes. No, no I, I mean, having been a mayor and having seen so many great visions for land use, basically die on, yeah. the, on the altar of, of a parking requirement. I, I've lived this. And you see a lot of cities and communities now moving on from that. By the way, to me, the second most exciting thing about the potential for automated vehicles has mm-hmm. to do with this. The most exciting thing is the potential for safety pay. Yeah. Right? Human drivers were losing about 40,000 people a year, which is the same as gun violence with much less attention. Yeah. So if, if they can get the technology right, the safety win is the most important thing. But this maybe the second most important thing is think about how land use changes if more of our vehicles... Uh, just come and get us, and then right. park themselves, you know, out in, in the county at three in the morning, and then wake themselves back up. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a very different from a scenario where we have to allocate so much of our land from our homes to our commercial spaces to parking. This is a great conversation, but I don't know if I buy this unless like it's an entirely new community and built an entirely different way. I feel like people want to have their car waiting for them. I don't feel like they want to like hit a button and have it be there 20 minutes later, you know? We're too spoiled for that world. I don't know though. Like I would love to see what a city that's actually designed for the world that we want now and with the technology that we have now actually looks like. But it's hard to build a new city. Turns out, really freaking hard to build a new city. And as many cities have found out, even with today's cars driven by people, you don't need as much parking as you thought you did. Here's a question that you can settle the oh. debate. Zipper merges. Should you merge early so that everybody's in, or should you just go to the end and then merge at the last moment? Mm. This is not an official policy. This is an official policy <laughs> position of the federal government. I have been told by people smarter than me about this stuff that you just, you go for it and work it out at the, you work it out at the, at the point last of moment. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Okay. Gas stations seem a lot more reliable than chargers right now. Why? Because we're newer at this when it comes to chargers. One of the things we put in the federal standards for the chargers that we're funding across the country is an uptime standard, 97% to start, and then okay. we really want it to go up from there. Because, yeah, I mean, in the same way that when you go to the gas station, you know, once It's unusual while, to see a, the pump with the bag yeah, on Yeah, sometimes you see yeah. it, but you're not expecting to run into that. Yeah. Had to look into this. $7.5 billion approved as part of the infrastructure bill to build tens of thousands of chargers across the U.S., Uh, That was a couple of years ago, and basically none have been built. And in part, it is because of the standards that they would like them to meet. They have to have 97% uptime, which is way higher than average. They have to be within a mile of the interstate. They have to have at least 150 kilowatts of charging at each charger, which is a lot, but a lot of Tesla chargers have even more than that. And it's just like government, you know, it's like the state has to submit a proposal to the administration and it it slows everything way down. They think that it's going to pick up in 2024, but basically none of that money has been spent and none of those chargers have been built. Let's hope that it happens though. On the other hand, one thing you can't do is uh, fill up your car with gas at home, which a lot of people, if they have a single family home, will be able to do It's so nice. Also, not going to the gas station has resulted in better dietary decisions for me. A lot of gas station coffee and uh, and chips have gone through my system, so I know what you mean. What's your favorite thing that rolls on the hot rolly thing at a gas station? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're all just variations on the universal hot dog taco pizza, right? It's yeah. Just kind of <laughs> just like morphing into different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Various cylindrical hot yeah. foods. You have a favorite? Or are I you don't. No. one of the elites? I, I st- <laughs> I stick with things that are coming in a bag. So okay, you're back, beef man. jerky, oh. beef jerky, corn. That's the beef jerky drawer right uh, there if you want some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, uh, your collection. And that's actually mushroom jerky, so now I'm one of the elites. I feel it necessary to say that, I, that mushroom jerky is among... I have so many jerkies in here. There's also beef jerky, and there is salmon jerky, and there are turkey sticks. And there's also fruit jerky, kind of. Like, these are just like little dehydrated fruit packets. And now that I've done that, I feel like I haven't defended myself, and this is worse. Are we getting there with, not with beef jerky, but with car chargers? We were as far into EVs as we were in gas cars around the time of Model T. They're good. Yeah. But think about how much better they're going to get. Yeah. The charging network we have now is not the charging network we're going to need. It's why President Biden set a goal of 500,000 by the end of this decade. Look, a lot of them the market will do, but a lot of them the market won't do. That's why we're federally right. funding the rest. 
depressed, especially apartment buildings, uh, lower income areas where it's not profitable today for some company mm -hmm. to do it. Uh, those are some of the places you most want to make sure there's charging. One thing that has become very clear to me as a person who owns an electric car is that it really, really works if you have a plug, you can plug it into it home. My commute isn't even long enough that I need a special charger. I just plug it into a regular outlet. So I looked this up, the $623 million for chargers from the Department of Transportation. Half of it is going to convenient locations for chargers for people who live in multifamily housing, like for example, at the multifamily housing. This is a different pot of money than the seven and a half billion dollars for fast chargers I was talking about a second ago. These are actually much easier things to install if they are designed for people to park at them. You don't have to try to charge the car super fast. The car is probably going to be sitting there for like 10 hours overnight. And you can tie reliability to fun. Yeah, that's the other thing. We can yeah. say they got to be reliable. Also, they got to be interoperable and transparent when it comes to pricing, which is something else we're Ooh. used to on gas. Not yeah. always seen on the electric. Side. True. There's a big sign that says right. how much the gas costs. Right. And I've never seen that at a charger. Uh, do you have a favorite mode of transportation? Favorite mode of Have you ever been on a jet ski? No. Oh my God. I'm pretty sure I would get hurt. <laughs> no. Just, you're a very safe person. I can tell you you don't have to be crazy on a jet ski. It's, just, it's fun. It's, just... it's just crazy in principle, isn't it? I just It seems to me like it would end in tears. <laughs> a perfectly good boat. Why would I get out of the boat? Oh my God. A jet ski is very fun. Huh. Pete Buttigieg. I, I believe you. <laughs> is that transportation, though? You can go from one place to another. I'm a big fan yeah. of walking, but I did just get an e-bike. Uh -huh. It is so fun. And it's... I can put my son on the back of it. Yeah. And there can be a big hill, and I'm loading, like carrying around 55 pounds of dead weight back there. I love him, but he's <laughs> heavy. Just get up the yeah. hill, hill, no problem. And otherwise, I'd have to like stop and walk him up, because yeah. I don't have quads like that. This is really going to, especially for kind of bicycle commuting, it really yeah. expands the range yeah. of distance and the range of people who might decide that's the right answer for them. That's why yeah. it's big. You know, the, the more bicycle commuting oriented cities of the world are kind of way ahead on this. We're, we're seeing it more and more in the U.S. Too. All right. What do you, you got another question for me? Yeah, this is a bit more earnest, but you know, you've, you've, you've uh, inspired a lot of people with, with talking about your experience with cancer. Mm. What can the policy world, what can Washington do better to support people living with and surviving cancer where where are we on universal health care no, no, no working on it are they oh, are they it is true that when pete ran for president uh he did want what's called the medicare for all who want it plan which i think is that sounds great I'd love a Medicare for all who want it because it doesn't seem like we're going to get rid of private insurance in the U.S. But of course, this is the Secretary of Transportation. So uh, not the kind of guy who has the power to sort of unilaterally change the healthcare situation in the U.S. I think that would be a big one. So I had like the double benefit of having a cheap cancer, which do exist. I did not realize. But like the most expensive part of my cancer was scans. And then I had the other advantage of, of having a situation, you know, where I, I had both with work, I had flexibility. Mm. Uh, and also with like support systems in general yeah. uh, and the amount of money in my bank account. Not, I didn't have to worry about that stuff. And I think about that all the time. I know that there are systems in place. There's like FMLA, Family Me yeah. Leave Medical Act mm -hmm. or something. Is that right? Yeah. That are there for people. But I know from talking to people who have had kids go through serious yeah. health problems, it's complicated. Yeah. I don't know how to make it simpler, but it seems like it could be simple. Yes. After I said all of that, I, I, you know, I kind of talk it out my butt. And Joe Biden has this thing called the cancer moonshot. Uh, and I assume that this was all about research. And, and But like, it's partially about research, but it is also about this very thing. There is a thing under the Department of Labor that says the DOL created new resources to help workers living with cancer, their caregivers and cancer survivors understand and make use of their rights. Uh, under the Family and Medical Leave Act. So I'm sure that it remains annoying to deal with, but the very thing that I brought up is a thing that exists. You know, you're talking about the the, the, the costs of it. I think about my my mother-in-law who uh, had a, has kind of skin cancer that the chemotherapy is topical. Mm -hmm. It looks like a tube of toothpaste, yeah. but it's thousands of dollars yeah. a tube. Yeah. And they have a landscaping uh, kind of mom and pop operation. But the Affordable Care Act is why she's able to afford that treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we definitely have a long way to go as a country. I think, um, uh, as you know, the president cares a lot about this. And uh, uh, But I'm also just really glad we have that in, in terms of the ACA. Roads mm -hmm. seem to be made of a lot of, bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, highways seem to be made of the stuff that lasts forever. They never have to fix the highways. Mm. My... <laughs> <laughs> I'm fixing a lot of highways right now. <laughs> but like, it takes like three years before the potholes accumulate on my neighborhood streets. Why not yeah. make my my street out of the stuff that lasts yeah. long? The short answer is cost. I'm fixing a lot of highways now. <laughs> Back when I was mayor, I filled a lot of potholes. Yeah. Like literally one year, I think we did 50,000 potholes. But we are actually working on this. If you go next to the CIA headquarters, there is a 
slightly, but in my opinion, only slightly less glamorous government facility, which is the Turner Fairbanks uh -huh. facility run by our Federal Highway Administration, which is part of our department. I tried to find out a little bit more about the Highway Research Center, but there just actually wasn't that much information. I can tell you, however, that it has six Google reviews, all five stars, and Jerome O'Connor says each lab is a first-class operation, and I mean, I have no reason to question him. If you happen to be flying over it, which it sometimes is on the flight path if you're landing at, uh, at DCA, you will notice uh, what in in a parking lot, what looks like 10 or 12 almost identical little strips of road. They look the same from the top. If you looked at a cross section of it, it would look like a layer cake. Paving isn't just asphalt on dirt, right? There, there's of course, gravel. Everyone knows stuff. that. They did it like 12 different ways. <laughs> okay. With different combinations and different thicknesses of the different and different. And in the middle of it, I have one on my desk. It looks like it's part of the gravel, only it's red because it's not real gravel. It's a piece of plastic with a little chip inside that beams back uh -huh. data. And we have hundreds of these yeah. spread across the layers of these dozen or so different strips of road. Mm -hmm. And they drive back and forth over it <laughs> hundreds or thousands of times and also just <laughs> let it sit in the elements for a yeah. while. And they're yeah. taking readings on exactly which one is doing better under which conditions so that we can optimize the next generation of paving material. There's also some market failures in here. So, so one of the issues is the pressure that a mayor or a local or state government is under to cover as much as they can, as mm -hmm. quickly as they can, means that a lot of mayors or, or states are in a situation where if I said, all right, here's this material, here's this paving material, it's going to last 50% longer, but it's going to cost you 30% more, mm -hmm. they would actually have to feel that they have to say no because they're under such pressure to do as much as they can this right year that they couldn't wait until you get the payoff. There's actually a whole R&D part of our department. It's probably the part people know about the least. We're even trying to stand up an ARPA-I, like, uh, like DARPA uh -huh. or ARPA-E. DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is a part of the Department of Defense that does re like advanced research projects. What they call high-risk, high-reward stuff, where they're like, I don't know if this is going to work, but if it does, it's gonna be a big deal. Their biggest thing that they kicked off was probably the internet, but also GPS and graphical user interfaces and the mouse. It has been a successful project, but people are like, maybe we should think about this for things other than war. So you have ARPA-H, which is like high risk, high reward for health stuff, and ARPA-I for infrastructure. That's what he's talking about. To do some of these really far out things like self-healing concrete or carbon negative road paving or a 500 year bridge. Because America's gonna be here in 500 years, Pete. Better. I'm like, yeah, put some spider silk in there. I don't know. What is your favorite invention? Here about, how about this? Just the idea that we can ask the universe questions and it can answer us and we can get better at figuring out how to ask questions. Hmm. So and that's science. science. Yeah. yeah. I think that was like a really important invention. Is someone here? Hello. Oh, my son. Oh, hey. Oren, come here. Nice to meet you. Can I get a big uh, handshake? Yeah. Oren? You had a question. Oh, do you have a question? Oh, Oren, you got a question? You can tell it to daddy. Uh, he wants to know, since you are the Secretary of Transportation, if you own secretary birds, because if you have secretary birds, if we had snakes, they could eat them, no problem. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Is that. I don't know that much about birds. Is that a kind of bird? Secretary birds are endemic to Africa. They are birds of prey. They eat meat. They eat all kinds of meat, but in, among the meat that they do eat is, is snakes. Wikipedia says the importance of snakes in the diet has been exaggerated in the past, although they can be locally important and venomous species like adders and cobras are regularly among the types of snakes preyed upon. Look at this skeleton! That's wild! That thing's mostly leg! Why do secretary birds share a name with secretaries of transportation and the interior and such? I've looked. Possibly Possibly because they were kind of domesticated to guard crops from things that might eat the crops, and so they were like the secretary of the field. Also, maybe because they look, they've got a bunch of quill pins tucked behind their heads, and they're wearing like long waistcoats, so they looked like the men in the 1800s who did secretary type stuff. That was the quietest whisper I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. Why don't we just make the trains go faster? We are. Oh, great! First of all, we're building high speed rail. So, are we? Yeah, we really are. Yeah, I just broke ground on one two weeks ago. It's true. The infrastructure law funded a part of this rail line that is going from Southern California to Las Vegas. It's going to be a 185 mile per hour train that'll run down the middle of I-15. To drive from LA to Las Vegas, it might be like four hours. On this train, it's going to be two. It's, it's really, it's like a thing. I had no idea. They want to be up and running by 2028. Okay. Uh, that's fast. Can I bet the name of my podcast on, on whether or not that's going to hit on time. You could. Would you? Probably goes against some federal ethics rule, but uh, <laughs> they do it. I get to rename your podcast. Yes. All right. All right. So yeah, if they if they finish Brightline West in 2028, Pete Buttigieg gets to rename our podcast. I'm sorry. It's a it's a federal law. The trains that we have, like just a regular Amtrak mm -hmm. long distance train, could be much faster 
if the freight railroads that actually own the rails sure. got out of the way. So they get priority because they own them. Oh, but here's the interesting thing. You might say there should be a rule that passenger trains can go first, right? Get this. There is a rule that passenger trains can go first. They don't get priority. One of the conditions of the formation of Amtrak and the relief that the, the railroads got from their common carrier obligations 50 years ago, part of the deal was if there's a passenger train on your tracks and you're what's called the host railroad, mm -hmm. you got to let it go first. But that's not what they do. That's not what they do. Sometimes. We're doing some work on that, too. Okay. Now, part of that's with the Surface Transportation Board. That's an independent body. That's not us that regulates railroads. Established in 1996, the Surface Transportation Board of the U.S. is an independent federal agency that serves as an adjudicatory board. It has the authority to regulate rates, service, construction, acquisition, and abandonment of rail lines. They're stepping up enforcement of this. Mm -hmm. We're involved in some of the data gathering and some of the other work to help uh, do something about that. Interesting. Ever since we made clear that we're doing that, we've already seen a better rate of compliance. I tried to find any mention of this stuff going on anywhere, and I did find something eventually on a freight industry publication called Freight Waves. I mean, look, this stuff is important, but it's in the nitty gritty. It's very deep in the weeds. Today's unanimous decision reflects the board's serious commitment to fulfilling its congressionally established duties under the PRIIA to adjudicate disputes over passenger rail on-time performance. This framework will ensure that the board has the information it needs to fulfill its mandate to enforce the preference standards and ensure reliable on-time performance for passenger rail. Because here's the thing, that the companies that, that are running the rail are also running the freight, and Amtrak is running on their lines. But the companies, by law, have to give the lines preference. But they'd rather not because they want to give their own trains preference. So if nobody is coming after them for this, they're not going to do it. So we're coming after them for it. Do you think that we could be headed into a world where there are just fewer cars on the road? Or is that just un-American? You know, I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. Our, our city was built around sure. Studebaker. But I do think it's evolving in terms of our relationship with cars. We, we got to a point, especially between kind of the 50s and the 70s, where we started having our cities and our lives revolve around cars mm -hmm. rather than having the cars serve us. The whole appeal yeah. of cars is freedom and choice. But now we have some designs that actually take the freedom and the choice away because they compel you to bring 2,000 pounds of metal with you yeah. in order to get certain places. We want to make sure people have choice. Things like microtransit, not just e-bikes, but what's going on, what ride share kind of makes possible. All of this mm -hmm. can change the texture of what our cities and towns are like in a way that I do think means we will be less likely to be stuck having to use a car whether we want to or not even if cars in some way shape or form are gonna mm -hmm. always be an important part of transportation what role do you think transportation plays in the availability of housing i think they absolutely go hand in hand yeah. i would always go to the conference of mayors when i was a mayor i still do but i have never seen a time when all the mayors i talk to ev from every part of the country are focused on a single issue wow and it's been housing but there's so many reasons why housing and transportation are related i mean the, the most basic is is that you live somewhere that you can get to work and you wind up with a lot of people who either live impossibly far away from work so they can be somewhere they can afford or they live somewhere they can't really afford so that they can get to work. Both of those scenarios can be addressed through better transportation plus on your on your monthly budget. Transportation and housing costs hit obviously at the same time and the lower income you are, the further north that goes of 40% of yeah. your family budget. You know, knowing that at the end of the day, we don't actually experience distance in miles. We experience it in minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, the more good options we can create, including supporting transit-oriented development, supporting good transit options, uh, and just smarter planning, the more we can fit together a transportation agenda with a housing agenda, which also gives you a climate payoff because mm -hmm. there can be fewer trips that you were compelled to take just by the layout of your commute right. and how you shop and, and, and everything else you got to do that requires you to go somewhere. I mean, obviously you're inside of it, but do you feel like when you talk to mayors across the U.S. that for the most part, everybody's just trying to make things better for their people? Oh, yeah, especially mayors. You know, when you're a mayor, it's it's not... You may have a strong ideology or partisan point of view, but most of the problems you deal with aren't through and through <laughs> aren't, partisan aren't issues, right? part of the culture war, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're trying to get <laughs> yeah. trash picked up and fill potholes and, and the rest of you are compelled to, to deal with things in a very pragmatic way without surrendering your values because your values come into play right. in so many different ways. Right. And the, the mayors, I, I, I still view the world as much through the eyes of a former mayor as through the eyes of a, of a federal official. Mm -hmm. And I think as a federal official, probably the best indication of whether we're doing a good job 
is whether mayors' lives are a little bit easier, jobs are a bit easier yeah. because of what we're doing. And I will say it would have been nice. I mean, being a mayor, I think, is harder now even than it was when I mm-hmm. was doing this 10 or ten or 8 years ago. But it really would have been nice when I was mayor if there was a $1.2 trillion infrastructure package coming yeah. out of Washington that yeah. would help us get lead out of our pipes and get electric school buses and yeah. fill in holes in the road and get transit and fix airports and yeah. all the things we're doing here. That's great. I wish that I had asked him why he thinks it's harder to be a mayor now than it was 10 years ago. Knowing some people in local government, I like have my own answer to this question. And I really do think that like it's just that the temperature is hotter. Like People are bringing big existential fears into local government. And a lot of those big existential fears are made up by the internet. And suddenly the local officials have to deal with this hot potato. Just like it was hard for me in this video to find information about how the Surface Transportation Board is dealing with the freight carriers preferring freight over Amtrak, even though they're legally required to do the opposite. There's no Twitter threads about that. Why would there be? There shouldn't be. But that's the work that government is doing and local government is doing especially. So I obviously want to be looking to vote for people whose values align with mine. I also want to be looking for people who are focused on solving problems that are the big problems the towns have, like housing, like housing. Thank you for coming to my house. Thank you for having me over. Uh, thank you for my pen. And uh, I made these when I was sick. I, I designed socks. And I, so those are my cancer socks that I designed while I was on chemo. Thank and I wanted you to have them. Oh, well, I appreciate that. In addition to the Garfield. The ant, yeah, I'm not walking away empty handed. Thanks, Pete. John, I'll see you on, on Tuesday. See you, John.